Hey, how's it going? Thanks for tuning in. We're going to test out this um, uh, this new software. Seems to be working for doing these broadcasts. <clears throat> Test, test, yeah. Audio looks good, video looks good. All right. Well, uh, thanks for tuning in. You're listening to Gnostic Studies. And today we're going to continue our Gnostic Psychology series. We're moving to the intermediate part. We've covered classes 1 through 10 over the summer of the introduction to Gnostic Psychology. And now we're going to jump into the, uh, the, the, next, the next phase, phase 2, which is influences. Uh, just want to double check. Uh, are you guys seeing influences on the screen right now? Does it say influences at the top? Because I'm just trying to refine my understanding of these, of the program. Or does it just say, does it just have the website with the picture? Okay, you're seeing it? Sweet. Thank you. All right, let's jump into it. So uh, if you want to review the other material, we'll post a link when we're done with that, but um, the previous material that we're building off of. But now we want to move into this next phase, as we mentioned already, influences. This, this class and the next class are both related to the different influences, esoteric influences that we encounter in our life and how to take advantage of those influences or how to understand them. So we'll just jump into it and feel free to, to throw up any questions you may have uh, while we're reading. Part one, influences crystallization of the human being's possible development. Or I should say influences crystallization and the human being's possible development. From the esoteric point of view, all people are machines governed by external influences. If you think that there is something that chooses its own path, something that can stand against mechanization, then you think that not everything is equally mechanical. Art, poetry, thought are just as mechanical as everything else. Human beings are machines, and nothing but mechanical actions can be expected of machines, although there are people who are not machines. So we talked about human machine before, and we'll talk more about it in this series, and especially in the second class um, of influences. But the idea that we're human machines is important to understand, because a machine, like a computer, takes in input and it gives out output. Right? So there's, there's an in and out. The food that we eat, right? It, it has an effect on us. The impressions we receive from movies and television, from the internet, uh, from interacting with others, from nature, those impressions have an effect on us. And then they, they result in us processing it, that the human machine processes it, and then we produce something. Something comes out of that. Um, positive or negative or neutral depends. As we have said before, the human being's chief delusion is their conviction that they can do. All people think that they can do, all people want to do, and the first question all people ask is what should they do? But actually nobody does anything and nobody can do anything. This is the first thing that must be understood. Everything happens. Everything that occurs to a person, all that is done by them, 
all that comes from them, all this happens. And it happens in exactly the same way as rain falls as a result of a change in the temperature in the higher regions of the atmosphere or the surrounding clouds, or as snow melts under the rays of the sun, or as dust rises from the wind, etc. So meaning that there is some cause and effect relationship that we may not be aware of. We just see the rain falling, but actually something occurred in order for that, that rain to, uh, for those wa that water to accumulate in such a way and, and to fall. So we should understand that our, our thoughts and our feelings and our sensations, even we could even say our desires, can be the result of receiving certain impressions, receiving certain um, uh, causes that produce an effect in us as a machine. The human being is a machine. All their deeds, actions, words, thoughts, feelings, convictions, opinions, and habits are the result of external influences, external impressions. Everything they say, do, think, feel, all this happens. To establish this for oneself, to establish this fact for oneself, to understand it, to be convinced of its truth, means getting rid of a thousand illusions about ourselves, about being creative and consciously organizing our own life, and so on. There is nothing of this kind. Everything happens. Popular movements, wars, revolutions, changes of government, all this happens. And it happens in exactly the same way as everything happens in the life of individual people. A human being is born, lives, dies, builds houses, writes books, not as he or she wants to, but as it happens, since everything happens. The human being does not love, hate, desire. All this happens. But no one will ever believe you if you tell them that they can do nothing. This is the most offensive and the most unpleasant thing that you can tell people. It is particularly unpleasant and offensive because it is the truth, and nobody wants to know the truth. When you understand this, it will be easier to see our true situation. But it is one thing to understand with the mind, and another thing to feel it with one's whole mass, to comprehend it, and to be really convinced that it is so, and to never forget it. So this is not meant to be pessimistic. It's meant for us to understand that we often react to things and we don't understand the chain of events, the cause and effect relationship that exists. And the purpose of our studies is to get us out of the situation so that we're not just reacting all the time and so that we can become a human being that has authentic individuality and isn't just uh, justifying our like or dislike for the impressions that we receive. Humanity in organic life on earth is acted upon simultaneously by influences proceeding from various sources and different worlds. Influences from the planets, influences from the moon, it's a new moon today, influences from the sun, influences from the stars. Are all these influences act simultaneously? One influence predominates at one moment and another influence at another moment. And for the human being, there is a certain possibility of making a choice of influences. In other words, of passing from one influence to another. This is the key. There is the possibility of choosing one influence over another. To explain how, we would need first to understand one thing. It is impossible to become free from one influence without becoming subject to another. The whole thing, 
all the work upon ourselves consists in choosing the influence to which you wish to subject yourself, and then of actually falling under this influence. And for this, it is necessary to know beforehand which influence is the more profitable. Many things are possible, but it is necessary to understand that a person's being, both in life and after death, if it does not exist, if it does exist, sorry, if it does exist after death, may be very different in quality. A person's being may be very different in quality. The human machine, with whom everything depends upon external influences, with whom everything happens, who is now one, the next moment another, the next moment a third, has no future of any kind. They are buried, and that is all. Right? The human machine is buried. Essence is different than the human machine. The human ref machine refers to our uh, organism, our human organism. In order to be able to speak of any kind of future life, there must be a certain crystallization, a certain fusion of one's inner qualities, a certain independence of external influences. In certain cases of fuller crystallization, what people call reincarnation may be possible after death. And in other cases, what people call existence on the other side may be possible. In both cases, it is the continuation of life with the astral body and with the other superior existential bodies of the being. What does the expression astral body mean or refer to? Many of the esoteric systems that use this expression state that all people have an astral body. This is somewhat confusing or we could even say incorrect. So we should clarify. According to the Gnostic system that we're studying, all people have a lunar astral body, which is also called the body of desires. But not all people have a solar astral body, and as such, not all people are liberated from the body of desires. Remember, Buddhism says that desire causes suffering. And so the body of desires can be very problematic for us. So if we want to get off the wheel of samsara and end our suffering, then obviously we need to address the role that desires play in that. What is called the solar astral body is obtained by means of fusion, that is, by means of terribly hard inner work and struggle. The human being is not born with it, and only very few people acquire a solar astral body. If it is formed, it may continue to live after the death of the physical body, and it may be born again in another physical body, because it, it corresponds to the essence. If this person who has a solar astral body is not reborn, then in the course of time that astral body will also eventually die. It is not immortal, but it can live long after the death of the physical body. Fusion, inner unity, is obtained by means of friction, by the internal struggle. All this is from uh, Gurdjieff and Ospensky in the book uh, In Search of the Miraculous. And let's see, yeah, all these quotes are from In Search of the Miraculous. Inner struggle. If a person lives without inner struggle, if everything happens in them without opposition, if they go wherever they're drawn or wherever the wind blows, then they remain just as they are. But if a struggle begins in them, and particularly if there is a definite line in this struggle, then gradually permanent traits begin to form themselves. They begin to crystallize. But crystallization is possible on a right foundation, and it's possible on a wrong foundation. 
friction, the struggle between yes and no, can easily take place on a wrong foundation. For instance, a fanatical belief in some idea or the fear of sin can evoke a terribly intense struggle between yes and no. And a person may crystallize on these foundations. But this would be a wrong and unhelpful crystallization. Such a person will not possess the possibility of further development. In order to make further development possible, they must be melted down again. And this can be accomplished only through terrible suffering. Crystallization is possible on any foundation. Take, for example, a robber, a really good, genuine thief. They will stand with a rifle or a knife or whatever behind a stone or a tree by the roadside for eight hours without moving. Could you do this? All the time, mind you, a struggle is going on in them. They are thirsty and hot and flies are biting them but they stand still. Another example is a monk. He's afraid of the devil. All night long he beats his head on the floor and prays. Thus, eventually, crystallization is achieved. In such ways, people can generate in themselves an enormous inner strength. They can endure torture. They can get what they want. This means that there is now in them something solid, something permanent. Such people can become immortal if they learn to properly direct themselves in order to win the inner struggle. Sacrifice is necessary. If nothing is sacrificed, nothing is obtained. Right? We still need to do an exchange, which is an idea we've mentioned in multiple classes. This idea that the universe is an exchange of energy. So we have to trade, trade up, right? Trade from, from one situation, from one level of being into another level of being. We have to give up the things that correspond to that lower level of being if we want to move to a higher level of being. And it's necessary to sacrifice something precious at the moment, something we care about at the moment, even if later we don't care about it. So we need to sacrifice something precious at the moment and to sacrifice for a long time and to sacrifice a great deal. In order to understand what the human being is at the present level of development, it is necessary to imagine, to a certain extent, what the human being can become, that is, what they can attain. Only by understanding the correct sequence of development possible will people cease to ascribe to themselves what at present they do not possess and what perhaps they can only acquire after great effort and great labor. According to an ancient teaching, traces of which may be found in many systems, both old and new, a human being who has attained the full development possible a human being, in the full sense of the word, consists of four bodies. These four bodies are composed of substances which gradually become finer and finer, which mutually interpenetrate one another, and which form four independent organisms standing in definite relationship to one another, but capable of independent action. In Gnosis, these are also referred to as the soul, that is, different aspects of the soul. The reason why it is possible for four bodies to exist is that the human organism, that is, the physical body, has such a complex organization that under certain conditions, a new independent organism can grow within it, inside affording a much more convenient and responsive instrument for the activity of consciousness than the physical body. So we can develop a new organism within us. We know that this is obviously possible for a, a woman to give birth, to um, have a, a, 
independent organism, but we're talking about something spiritual that all human beings can do. The consciousness manifested in this new body, the body grown within the physical body, is capable of governing it. And it has the full power and full control over the physical body. In this second body, under certain conditions, a third body can grow, again having characteristics of its own. The consciousness manifested in this third body has full power and control over the first two bodies. And the third body possesses the possibility of acquiring knowledge inaccessible either to the first nor to the second. And in the third body, under certain conditions, a fourth can grow, which differs as much from the third as the third differs from the second and as the second differs from the first. The consciousness manifested in the fourth body has full control over the first three bodies and itself. So this is something like a uh, one of those Russian dolls, right? Where you open one up and then there's another one inside. These four bodies are defined in different teachings in various ways. The first is the physical body. In Christian terminology, the carnal body. The second in Christian terminology, is the natural body. The third, the spiritual body. And the fourth, in the terminology of esoteric Christianity, is the divine body. In theosophical terminology, the first is called the physical body, the second is the astral, the third is the mental, and the fourth is the causal. In the terminology of certain Eastern teachings, the first body is the carriage, the second body is the horse, feelings, desires, the third is the driver, the mind, and the fourth is the master, the consciousness or willpower. Such comparisons and parallels may be found in most systems and teachings which recognize something more in the human being than the physical body. So remember, what they're talking about and what they've mentioned here is that in order to understand what we can become, we have to understand what the proper development of the human being actually is. So the, the proper development of the human being is not just to worry about the carriage, but to understand that we can become a master. And that requires the horse, the driver, the carriage, and the master, all of them. That is the physical, the astral, the mental, and the causal bodies. So we'll talk about this more, and of course this is what we discussed in Gnostic Chemistry and Cosmology class. In this class, and the, uh, the influences too, have a lot of overlap with the chemistry and cosmology, and if you guys want to, after we're done with studying intermediate, psychology, we could go that direction as well. We could jump into the chemistry and cosmology. So let's look at uh, this subject a little more and see if it interests us. But almost all these teachings, while repeating more or less familiar, in a more or less familiar form, the definitions and divisions of the ancient teaching, have forgotten or omitted its most important feature, which is that the human being is not born with these finer bodies and that they can only be artificially cultivated in us provided favorable conditions both internal and external are present. And those favorable conditions we'll see are going to be related also with the influences that we choose for ourselves, which is why we're discussing it in this class. The solar astral body is not an indispensable implement for a person. It is a great luxury, which only a few can afford. A person can live quite well without a solar astral body. Their physical body possesses all the functions necessary for life. A person without a solar astral body may even produce the impression of being a very intellectual or even spiritual person. And they may 
deceive not only others, but also themselves. This applies still more, of course, to the mental body and to the fourth, the causal body. Ordinary human beings do not possess these bodies or their corresponding functions, but they often think and make others think that they do. The reasons for this are first the fact that the physical body works with the same substances of which the higher bodies are composed. Only these substances are not crystallized in the physical body. They do not belong to it. And secondly, the physical body has all the functions analogous to those of the higher bodies, although, of course, they differ from them considerably. All right, we have emotions, we have mind, but they're not necessarily developed. The chief difference between the functions of a person possessing the physical body only and the functions of the four bodies is that in the first case, the functions of the physical body govern all the other functions. In other words, everything is governed by the physical body, which in its turn is governed by external influences. In the second case, the command or control emanates from the higher body. The functions of the physical body may be represented as parallel to the functions of the four bodies. In the first case, that is, in relation with the functions of a person with a physical body alone, or only a physical body, the automaton depends upon external influences. And the next three functions depend upon what the physical body and the external functions, and the, I'm sorry, and the external influences it receives. Desires or aversions, I want, I don't want, I like, I don't like, that is, fun functions occupying the place of the second body, depend upon accidental shocks and influences. Thinking, which corresponds to the functions of the third body, is an entirely mechanical process. Will is absent. In ordinary mechanical human beings, they have only desires and a greater or lesser permanence of desires and wishes is called a strong or weak will. So you can see here in this diagram, the first body directs the rest. So this is if we don't have the solar bodies developed, the physical body becomes the sort of driving factor there. And since it works off of external influences, then really external influences are the, the thing that push us pushes the physical body, the physical body creates desires. For example, the, um, the energy of Venus is strong, and let's say I'm uh, susceptible to that, then I feel uh, love, I feel this uh, attraction or desire, then, uh, that, then my thoughts start uh, following that desire, and then I start chasing things and, and uh, trying to find someone or something or, or um, buying flowers or chocolates or whatever, which are all external influences, all external ideas of what love is, as opposed to, uh, you know, trying to penetrate into the mysteries of love in order to understand them. So what we want to understand is the second case. That was the first case where the external influences uh, influence the, the physical body and therefore the physical body stimulates these other aspects, emotions, desires, the mind, and the willpower. Different contradictory wills. But the second case is the, the, uh, when we have our solar causal body. So the, in the second case, it's the opposite that happens. Things, the, the, um, Source of control doesn't start with the physical body, it starts with the causal body. So let's look at what Gurdjieff says about that. In the second case, that is in relation to the functions of the four bodies, the automatism of the physical body depends upon the influences of the other bodies. Instead of the discordant and often contradictory activity of different desires, there is individuality. 
dominating the physical body and its desires, which is able to overcome both its reluctance and its resistance. Instead of the mechanical process of thinking, there is consciousness. And there is will, that is, a, a power, not merely composed of various often contradictory desires belonging to different eyes or egos, but issuing from consciousness and governed by individuality. Only such a will can be called free. He's talking about free will, since it is independent of accident and cannot be altered or directed from outside or external influences. So now we're jumping into part two. Fusion, development, and the fourth way. An Eastern teaching describes the functions of the four bodies, their gradual growth, and the conditions of this growth in the following way. Let us imagine a vessel, or what's called a retort, filled with various metallic powders. The powders are not in any way connected to each other, and, are, and every accidental change in the position of this vessel changes the relative position of the powders to each other. So it's like there's different colored sand, but it's a metallic powder, and you shake up the vessel, and it shakes up the, the uh, powders inside. So they change in relation to each other. The, their position changes. If the vessel is shaken or tapped with the finger, then the powder which was at the top may appear at the bottom or in the middle, while the one which was at the bottom may appear at the top, etc. There is nothing permanent in the position of the powders, and under such condition, there can be nothing permanent. This is an exact picture of our psychic life. Each succeeding moment, new influences may change the position of the powder, which is at the top, and put another in its place, which is absolutely its opposite. Science calls this state of the powders the state of mechanical mixture. The essential characteristic of the interrelation of the powders to one another in this kind of mixture is the instability of these interrelations and their variability. Right? So obviously if this is a picture of our psyche, it's saying that there's uh, an instability in our psychology which is why this is not what we're covering in the first introductory series, because we discussed many of the foundational ideas that allow us to understand this deeper in the first uh, 10 classes, Introduction to Gnostic Psychology. It is impossible to stabilize the interrelation of powders in a state of mechanical mixture, but the powders may be fused the nature of the powders make this possible. To do this, a special kind of fire must be lit under the vessel, which, by heating and melting the powders, finally fuses them together. Fused in this way, the powders will be in the state of a chemical compound, and now they can no longer be separated by those simple methods which separated and made them change places when they were in a state of mechanical mixture. The contents of the vessel will have become indivisible or an individual. This is a picture of the formation of the second body, the solar astral body. The fire by means of which fusion is attained is produced by friction, which in its turn is produced in a person through an internal struggle. If a person gives way to all their desires or panders to them, then there will be no inner struggle in them, no friction, and no fire. But if, for the sake of attaining a definite aim, they struggle with desires that hinder them, then they will thus create a fire which, which will gradually transform their inner world into a single whole. Let us return to our example. The chemical compound obtained by fusion possesses certain qualities. So if we were able to 
fight against ourselves, so to speak, and create that inner friction, understanding that there's aspects of ourselves that we do need to say no to, and there's other aspects that we need to say yes to. If we were to, to uh, do that inner fight and create that friction, which then creates a fire, then we could fuse those uh, elements together. This is the symbolism that Gurdjieff is using. The chemical compound obtained by fusion possesses certain qualities, a certain specific gravity, a certain electrical conductivity, and so on. These qualities constitute the characteristics of the substance in question. Right? So you could say a certain uh, density or gravity, a certain electrical conductivity is, um, is the, the characteristics of the solar astral body. But by means of a certain kind of work upon it, the number of these characteristics could also be increased. That is, the solidified mixture or alloy may be given new properties which did not belong to it before. It may be possible to magnetize it or to do something else with it. The process of imparting new properties to the alloy corresponds to the process of the formation of the third body, the solar mental body, and of the acquisition of new knowledge and powers with the help of this third body. By means of a special kind of work for all three bodies, the acquired properties may be made permanent and it may be made the permanent and inalienable possession of the solar mental body. The process of fixing these acquired properties corresponds to the process of the formation of the fourth body, the solar causal body. And the only person who possesses the four fully developed bodies can be really called a man or authentic human being in the full sense of the word. So what's being said is that we're not really done being developed. That as a, a humanoid right now, with it, with we, when we don't possess these bodies, the solar astral, solar mental, solar causal body, we're not yet fully developed. We're not yet an authentic human being. We may call ourselves human beings, or mankind, or whatever you want to say, but in terms of objective reality, we don't yet possess that. Because this type of person, an authentic human being, possesses many properties which ordinary people do not possess. And one of these is immortality. So, when we possess our solar causal body, we can say that we possess our soul. And prior to that point, we don't. Uh, we refer you to the book, The Perfect Matrimony by Samael Unveor. In the end of the book, the final chapter, you can just read the last few paragraphs where he emphasizes this. He talks about it and says that people really don't understand that that's uh, what we need to do. That's part of life. And part of life is understanding this friction that is, the ability to fight against ourselves and knowing what aspects of ourselves we should fight against so that we develop on a right foundation, not on a wrong foundation. All religions and all ancient teachings contain the idea that by acquiring the fourth body, the solar causal body, the person acquires immortality. And they also all contain indications of the ways to acquire this fourth body, i.e. immortality. In order to grasp the essential part of this teaching, it is necessary to clearly understand the idea that there is a way to develop the human being's hidden possibilities. There is a way. But the development of these possibilities is not a law. The law for a human being is existence in the circle of mechanical influences, in the state of human machine. 
the way of the development of hidden possibilities is a way against nature. And some even claim that it's against God. But it's not actually against God. It's against the level or the rung of nature that we currently occupy. It's a revolution. It's revolting against that and saying we want to move to the next higher rung. It would be more accurate to say that we need to dominate nature at a certain level in order to raise ourselves up to the next level. This explains the difficulties and the exclusiveness of the way. The way is narrow and straight, but at the same time, only through it can anything be attained. In the general mass of everyday life, especially modern life, the way is a small, quite imperceptible phenomenon, which, from the point of view of mechanical life, need not exist at all. But this small phenomenon contains in itself all that a person has for the development of their hidden possibilities. The way is opposed to everyday life. It is based upon other principles. It is subject to other laws. It consists, in it consists the power and the signif significance of this esoteric development. In everyday life, even in a life filled with scientific, philosophical, religious, or social interests, there is nothing, and there can be nothing, which could give the possibilities which are contained in the way. The way leads the human being to immortality. Everyday life, even at its best, leads the human being to death and can lead to nothing else. So, the, we can use everyday life to our advantage in order to create this fusion, in order to create this friction. But we have to understand that just like in the past, people remembered divinity in their everyday life, and in some countries they even uh, do practices that help remind, like the culture does it, help remind us of divinity. In a lot of the Western culture, there isn't that. And it's almost considered uh, inappropriate, and uh, like we're forcing it on somebody if we choose to pray before we eat or uh, not do activities that for other people are, are normal. Not treat people in a certain way, not talk to people in a certain way. So we have to understand that we can take advantage of the circumstances of life. We don't need to run away from uh, life. We need to understand how to use it to our advantage. Because otherwise, if we don't use it to our advantage, it's going to use us. It's going to chew us up and spit us out. It's like somebody said uh, that if, if, we, if we just quit our job or we don't you know, go to work or whatever, then they're just going to get somebody else for us to replace our position. And so sometimes we make these great sacrifices for work, and then we realize that work doesn't really care. Now, obviously, work is one thing, and the people at work are another thing. So uh, let's understand that... that we need to be intelligent in our relationship with our source of income, in our relationship with our co-workers and, and uh, customers or, or clients, other people we come in contact with, so that we can use all of those experiences to not just be a mechanical machine. Because otherwise, as it says, we're just going to die. Everyday life even at its best, leads the human being to death and can lead to nothing else. Whether we're a millionaire or a billionaire and we're, we've got all the money, if we don't create our solar bodies, when our physical body dies, that's it. So we need to take advantage of life in order to create these solar bodies. To create that friction and fight against those aspects of ourselves that are leading to more suffering, more problems, etc. As a matter of fact, 
If we take all the people who are neither fakirs, monks, nor yogis, and let's clarify that a fakir is a person related with the motor center that's able to uh, dominate their motor instinctive center, centers. A monk is someone who can dominate their emotional center, and a yogi is someone who can dominate their um, intellectual center. If we take all these people who are neither fakirs, monks, nor yogis, and of whom we may say with confidence that they will never be either fakirs, monks, or yogis, which means that a person, if we take all the people who will never be able to dominate their centers, then we may say with undoubted certainty that their possibilities cannot be developed and will not, not be developed. They won't develop those possibilities in themselves. This needs to be understood in order to grasp what's going to follow. We need to learn how to, to dominate ourselves, how to fight against ourselves, how to develop ourselves, how to work against our centers. That is, how to use them to our advantage and not allow them to use us. So how to use our human machine and not let the human machine direct us but use it as a machine and understand that's what it is. In the ordinary conditions of cultured life, the position of a person, even a very intelligent person, who is seeking for knowledge is hopeless because in the circumstances surrounding them, there is nothing resembling either the fakir or yogi schools. While the religions of the West have degenerated to such an extent that for a long time, there has been nothing alive in them. So he's saying normally we don't encounter a school or a way of uh, working with any of the three centers, right? Because he says the religions, which is related with the monk. So he's saying we don't encounter normally a school that will teach us how to dominate our three brains. Various occult and mystical societies and naive experiments in the nature of spiritualism and so on, can give no results whatsoever. And the position would indeed be hopeless if the possibility of yet a fourth way did not exist. So the first three ways are the fakir, the monk, and the yogi. So he's saying that there's a fourth way. The fourth way requires no retirement into the desert, does not require a person to give up and renounce everything by which they formerly lived. The fourth way begins much further on than the way of the yogi, related with the mind. This means that a person must be prepared for the fourth way, and this preparation must be acquired in ordinary life and be a very serious one, embracing many different sides. Furthermore, a person must be living in conditions favorable for work on the fourth way, or, in any case, in conditions which do not render it impossible. It must be understood that both in the inner and in the external life of a person, there may be conditions which create insurmountable barriers to the fourth way. Furthermore, the fourth way has no definite forms like the way of the fakir, the monk, and the yogi. And first of all, it has to be found. This is the first test. So if you're listening to this, then you've probably found it or been looking for it. It is not well known as the three traditional ways. There are many people who have never heard of the fourth way, and there are others who deny its existence or even its possibility of existing. At the same time, the beginning of the fourth way is easier than the beginning of the ways of the fakir, the monk, and the yogi. On the fourth way, it is possible to work and to follow this way while remaining in the usual conditions of life, continuing to do the usual work, preserving former relations with people and without renouncing or giving up things in the traditional sense. On the contrary, the conditions of life in which a person is placed at the beginning of their work, in which, so to speak, the work finds them, are the best possible conditions for that person. 
at any rate at the beginning of the work. These conditions are natural for that person. These conditions are the person themselves. Because a person's life and its conditions correspond to what that person is. Any conditions different from those created by life would be artificial for a person. And in such artificial conditions, the work would not be able to touch every side of their being at once. So part of what we're studying in Gnostic psychology is how to change ourselves and how to distinguish what we need to develop and what we need to uh, dissolve within ourselves. And so when we find the work we, and we analyze our life and we see the things that are wrong, we could say in quotation marks, things that, that we perceive needing to be changed, those are the things those are the conditions that correspond to what we are. That is, how we are in the present moment. So it's, it's important to observe those things. So that then we can say, how did I get here? Why am I like this? You know, why, why, why do I exist like this? Because of choices that we made. That same cause-effect relationship we were talking about before. And so we now need to learn how to um, burrow out, so to speak, how to peel the, the layers back. But we, it's important to recognize the real conditions that we're in and not create like artificial conditions. It says, any can conditions different from those created by life would be artificial for a person and in such artificial conditions the work would not be able to touch every side of their being at once thanks to this the fourth way affects simultaneously on every side of one's being it is work on the three rooms at once the fakir works in the first room the action brain right movement the monk on the second, the emotional brain, and the yogi on the third, the intellectual brain. In reaching this fourth room that the fourth way corresponds to, which is the equilibrium of the three brains, the fakir, the monk, and the yogi leave behind them many unfinished things, and they cannot make use of what they have attained because they are not masters of all their functions. The fakir is only the master of the body, but not of their emotions and their mind. The monk is master of their emotions, but not their body or their mind. And the yogi is the master of their mind, but not of their body and their emotions. So the fourth way differs from the other ways in that the principal demand made upon a person is the demand for understanding, or what we call in Gnosis, comprehension. The fourth way is sometimes called the way of the sly man, the sly person. The sly person knows something secret that the fakir, the monk, and the yogi do not know. The sly person won't necessarily tell us how they learned this secret. Perhaps they found it in some old books. Perhaps they inherited it. Perhaps they paid for it. Perhaps they stole it. It makes no difference. The sly person knows the secret and with its help outstrips the fakir, the monk, and the yogi. Of the four, the fakir acts in the crudest manner. He knows very little and understands very little. Let us suppose that by a whole month of intense torture, he develops a certain energy, a certain substance, which produces certain changes in him. He does it absolutely blindly, with his eyes shut, not knowing neither aim, methods, nor results, simply by imitating others. On the other hand, the monk knows what he wants a little better. He's guided by religious feeling, by religious tradition, by a desire for achievement, for salvation. He trusts his teacher, who 
tells him what to do, and he believes that his efforts and sacrifices are pleasing to God. Let us suppose that a week of fasting, continual prayer, privations, and so on, enables him to attain what the fakir developed in himself in a month of self-torture. So a week, instead of it taking a month, it now takes a week. The, no, the yogi knows considerably more. He knows what he wants. He knows why he wants it. He knows how it can be acquired. He knows, for instance, that it is necessary for his purpose to produce a certain substance in himself. He knows that this substance can be produced in one day, not in a week or a month, by a certain kind of mental exercise or concentration. So he keeps his attention on these exercises for a whole day without allowing himself a single outside thought. And thus he obtains what he needs. In this way, a yogi spends on the same thing only one day compared with a month spent by the fakir and a week spent by, I'm sorry, a month spent by the fakir and a week spent by the monk. But the fourth way knowledge is still more exact and perfect. A person who follows the fourth way knows quite definitely what substances they need for their aims, and they know what these substances can be produced, and they know that these substances can be produced within the body by a month of physical suffering, by a week of emotional strain, or by a day of mental exercises. And also, that they can be introduced into the organism from without, if it is known how to do so. That is, from the outside. right? We're talking about influences. External influences. And so, instead of spending a whole day in exercises like the yogi, a week in prayer like the monk, or a month in self-torture like the fakir, he simply prepares, this uh, the person who follows the fourth way simply prepares and swallows a little pill which contains all the substances that they want. And in this way, without a loss of time, they obtained the desired results. So, on the surface it may seem like we just need to take a pill, right? Some people are going to say, uh, there's similarities with the matrix, but uh, that's probably not what Gurdjieff was referring to. Because in English we have a saying that is, something is a difficult pill to swallow. When, when we have uh, uh, something that we need to confront or face about ourselves or about our life, about uh, what we need to change. So let's ask ourselves, what do we need to face? Because that will help us to see what has to change within us in order for us to progress. A summary of uh, what we talked about today. We said that we can't stop influences. This is what Gurdjieff tells us. We have the ability to pick, to choose the influence to which we wish to subject ourselves. But we have to pick one. And uh, he said that what's most beneficial is to know beforehand what is what the, the various result of those influences will be. He also said that through an internal struggle, we can crystallize something within ourselves. Then an internal struggle we call a gnosis the fight against ourselves. He says it's like friction because it produces in us fire and that fire can be used to fuse things, to solidify some principles within ourselves. And to walk on the path of the fourth way, we need to be sincere with ourselves, because this will save us a tremendous amount of time if we just realize what it is that we need to face, and just face it, look at our life in a totally different way. And this can help us to grow quickly on the path. So uh, we want to open it up for questions or comments. If you guys have any, please feel free to leave them. Uh, I want to thank you for your attention and your um, help at the beginning also, keeping, it, keeping us on track.
Uh, we're going to do a meditation tomorrow. So if you guys are interested in doing meditation, you're welcome to join us for that. 7.30 Mountain Time. Uh, I think it's that'd be 9.30 uh, East Coast and 6.30 West Coast. And then we're going to try and keep these going. Uh, we won't during Thanksgiving, the fourth week of November, and then, of course, during uh, the, the traditional Christian holidays and New Year in December. But other than that, um, we're going to try and keep it going. So there's a question, is, it, is this to say that no notable yogis from the Vedic tradition have ever taken the fourth way? No, it's, it's not. That's a good question, though. It's saying just that uh, the term yogi is used to refer to someone who is able to dominate the mind, the mental apparatus. But a real yogi, uh, in, in the, in the uh, inclusive sense, not in the sense that it's being used just in this, a real yogi is someone that actually can dominate all of those things. But the, the benefit of a yogi being able to dominate the mind is that then they can meditate without the mind interrupting them. So there certainly are yogis, and Swami Sivananda is considered one of them, who was able to uh, do this work and get the, um, the so, uh, acquire the solar bodies, become a master. Right, yeah, considering that yogis are usually only the master of the... the uh, intellect, but there are those that, that are more than that. Sometimes that's the most difficult one to dominate. It depends on us as an individual, but in general, the, the mind can be very difficult to dominate. Uh, you're welcome for the presentation. Yes, the uh, the person responded, said Swami Sivananda's book, Concentration and Meditation, is a really good book. I agree. Excellent book. It talks about pranayama, gives ideas on, on concentration. Yeah, excellent book. I agree with you. Well, all right. Doesn't look like there's any more questions or comments at this time. Uh, thank you guys again for your attention. And we want to invite you to meditation tomorrow as well as to class next week. And if you have any uh, questions or, or comments, please feel, to, feel free to email them. Uh, is oh, We got another question. Is morals and ethics a part of developing your solar body? That's a good question. Um, it is. It is. We talked a little bit about that. I believe it's in part eight of the introduction to Gnostic psychology class. It talks about the difference between morality and ethics. Uh, it's from the same book that we're quoting from today, In Search of the Miraculous, by uh, Ospensky, um, quoting Gurdjieff. So we need to have a... a ethical development. We need to have ethical development because ethics are related with the, the heart and they're related with a conscious spirituality, not just mo morals in the way that we've studied it is more like just rules that you have to follow. And as long as you follow them, then you can, you can consider yourself doing good. But of course, this system requires that we reflect and meditate and uh, uh, awaken our consciousness, fight for that uh, awareness to realize that just because something is considered moral doesn't mean that it's ethical and it doesn't mean that it's the right thing to do. We have to be dynamic. We have to know that what's correct in one situation 
may be incorrect in another situation. And, and the development uh, is learning how to be efficient with our energy and uh, especially our creative energy, but it's also about growing spiritually speaking. And that requires a consciousness, conscience, ethics. So hopefully that helped. Well, all right. Well, I'll try it again. Try sign off again. Thanks again, guys. Um, looking forward to to uh, sharing more with you next week. And again, feel free to email us if you have any questions or comments after this, or if you're not able to listen at the same time. So have a good evening, and and uh, talk to you soon.